I'm Natasha Scholl and I'm an author. So Found Wanting is my first book. It is a memoir that begins on the night that my boyfriend died suddenly and I was not able to save his life. It is a book about grief but also what happens in the aftermath of loss and I guess what happens the day after the worst day of your life. Um, which all sounds very heavy, but I hope there are moments of lightness as well and hope and joy. I think when I was writing the book, obviously it's a very personal book, but the way I wrote it was not so much because the word, the, the fact that it was a memoir sort of, it felt quite uncomfortable to write a memoir. It was like, who am I? I'm just an ordinary person. So I think when I structured it more like a grief memoir, and I was writing a book about, well, what is grief? What is that universal experience of grief? That's what sort of drove the narrative forward. So it was less a book about me, even though it is very personal and there is so much of me in there. But if I took myself out of that and I replaced my experience with someone else, would that speak to someone else's grief and someone else's loss and their feelings? And I think that's what I tried to capture. So it was less just about my individual experience and more about that collective experience of loss. And at every element I sort of thought, would someone else feel seen and more visible and more understood if they read this book and they've experienced something similar? So I think that's what sort of helped propel the narrative forward for me. So many people, I mean, writing is such a sort of lonely individual experience, but it takes a whole village of people to bring a book together. So. When I first started writing, I joined my local writers group. And so Eleni Hale was the facilitator and she was just so positive and encouraging. Um, and I remember in one of the very early versions of one of the very early chapters, she wrote a little note on it after sort of reading it in, the, um, in one of our get togethers and she wrote, this book will be published one day. And I kept that in my bedside drawer. And that was like one of the very beginning. And every time I just felt that sort of doubt creep in, I would just revisit that. So just having that one person who believed that this could be a real book one day helped. Um, also, I then also did a mentorship through Kill Your Darlings, the magazine with Rebecca Stafford, and that helped get the book to the finish line. So I had to do regular check-ins and I had to have a word count due. So that gave me structure and deadlines and to be accountable. Um, and so that's without being, you know, without having that external person that I was accountable to, that's what helped me get that first very messy draft. Um, and then also my husband, Dean, who is one of my biggest supporters, had been telling me for years, like, you need to write a book, you've got a book and you need to do this. And I think part of writing is there is so much, rejection is so much a big part of the whole writing process. It's just a fact of it. And that with everything that I saw as a setback, he would just keep saying, this will be published one day. Like he just had that complete belief. So just to, again, to have another person that believed that this would be a finished product um, and was worthy. And then I also, just before submitting to publishers, I did a manuscript assessment with Nadine Davidoff, who is brilliant, and a structural edit with her. So I sort of had, you know, it was a very, it felt like I was doing it writing in the middle of the night by myself, but I had this sort of I had a structure in place of other people to help push the process forward. I was a reader of Kill Your Darlings and I think, I think it popped up on like a Facebook ad or something um, where it, they were advertising their mentorships that they did. And I think I applied even on my phone. I think at that stage I was still still too sort of embarrassed to even admit that I wanted to write a book and that that was what I wanted because I was scared of failure, I guess, a lot at that stage. So I applied like on my phone and then that mentorship for me, I guess a mentorship is different for every person. For me, it was access to a published author. So it was that validation of someone who is in the industry reading my words. Um, so for me, that was what was really important. I guess it's different for each person, but also just having that structure of being accountable to someone else. So when I was halfway through that mentorship, that's when COVID hit. And so all my time was sort of taken away from me. We were at home, homeschooling four very young children, trying to balance work. And the time that I would normally, I mean, it was stolen time anyway, that writing time, it was already very minimal, but 
that was already that just got taken from me. But then I had, you know, I had deadlines in place, and it forced me to keep writing rather than to just put it off. So for a mentorship for me, it was just having someone who was in the industry who validated what I was doing, um, and who could give me that sort of insider advice and tips. Have you ever had writer's block? Yes, constantly. Um, I find for me sometimes the writing just flows um, and it's just like desperate to come out of my fingertips and I'm just feeling it and I'm vibing it and it's just all happening. And then other days I sit down at my desk and there's just nothing or I can write but then I'm reading it again and I just know it's not, it's clunky, it's not me, it doesn't feel like my best self on the page. Um, And then I think everyone's different but for me what helps with writer's block is reading. So I'll either pick up a book that is in the same genre or even something that's completely different, like poetry. Like I don't write poetry, but obviously reading poetry is beautiful. So just seeing the way that other people form sentences. So I think poetry is really helpful for me because it's separate enough from my work in that I'm not going to get stuck in someone else's voice, but just being sort of washed away in those that flow of words and seeing how other people construct things in a way that I never would, I find that really, it just unblocks something within me. And then also movement for me really helps. So going for a walk, listening to a podcast, one of the writing podcasts, listening to music, just that movement and breath and air and all those things just clear whatever is going on. When I was at uni, I studied arts law and through my arts degree, I was majoring in English and creative writing. So I had that sort of background and most of my tutors and lecturers then the, the common theme was it's really hard to break into the industry. It's really difficult to get a job as in the industry at all, like as an editor in the publishing industry to crack in as a writer. So I think I had that voice at the back of my head, like, oh, this is an impossible thing. So I sort of dismissed it for a while as that's not something I'll ever be able to do. It's so hard. And then... I just realised no one is going to rock up at my door and knock and say, oh, I heard you like to write and that you're very good at it. Would you like to write something? That's not something that was going to happen. So I just started writing little bits and pitching things and, you know, for online publications and it just sort of got everything started and then little things were getting picked up and then publishing in newspapers and it just reinforced that thing of, I'm never going to be a writer unless I actually write something, which sounds really obvious, but you only become a writer (laughs) when you write and some things will get published and some things won't, but how will you know unless you just do it? So I'd had bits read in sort of the writers group that I mentioned before Um, and then as so people were sort of reading it and then my husband said to me like when am I going to be able to read it and I didn't want to show him until I had a complete like until I knew I'd gotten to the end I knew it was messy and whatever but I needed to have it complete because he's very honest in his feedback and I was petrified that what it was awful and so yeah I had a full completed first draft and I gave it to him and I think he went away and read it in one sitting and I don't think I breathed properly the whole time I knew that he had it and then he came in and the first thing he said was it's beautiful you've done it so yeah that was that relief (laughs) and then whatever happened after that it was like whether it gets published or it doesn't or what other people say at least I knew I had that I had a finished first draft which was you know what I'd set out to do and I had his sort of approval and validation and feedback the the bit that was the scariest was probably in the weeks just before the book's release. So not everyone had read the book. I only gave um, a copy to sort of family members just before the release, which was, you know, I think I was just terrified. Um, So I think that was the scariest bit, knowing it was going to be published and it was going to be out there and having it in their hands and not knowing how they would react or respond because obviously it's very personal content and... In the writing process and through the editing process, I mean, I had their voice at the back of my head. So I knew that one day they would be reading it and I just hoped that I would make them proud and that they would be okay with the content. But 
in telling my story, I tried not to tell anyone else's story because it's their story to tell. It's But, you know, all our stories are completely interlinked and interwoven. So I tried as much as possible that whenever anyone else was mentioned or I was speaking to their grief or their loss or their lives, that I would do their story justice. So I think that was the scariest part and I was dreading giving it to them and then the response was just overwhelmingly beautiful. So I didn't need to be so scared, but, yeah, it was it was hard. Do you write in isolation or out in the world? Um, a bit of both. So... I think when I was right, part of that writer's group, I would write in isolation and then read stuff in a very raw form. So it was out there straight away. Um, with the actual writing process, I need to be quite insular. So I was just writing in the local library or at cafes. Sometimes I just needed a change of scenery. Well, yeah, just alone in the dark at night <laughs> on the couch eating chips. Um, yeah, I think I need to be a little bit isolated because I need to write as if no one else is ever going to see what I'm writing so I can get it all out there on the page and then edit it however I want. Yeah, I absolutely read while I'm writing. I know some writers tend not to because they feel like it sort of might muddy their voice or their writing style, but um, I have to because, well, I feel lost if I'm not reading a book, if I don't have a book by my bedside table to dive into. So I think I read for two reasons. One is just because it's something that gives me joy. And two, from a craft perspective, I always need to be connected to other writers to say, how are they writing? What are they doing? And it's a reminder that no two stories are the same. So I think part of that imposter syndrome when I was writing is, you know, other someone else could write this or it's, the story's already been told before or who am I to write this story? But then you read other books and they're so unique and no one else could have written that book except for that particular author which means no one else can write my book except for me. And there's always room for more stories. And just to be, as a reader, to be impacted by a writer and by a book, it just reminds me why I write, I guess. So, yeah, I love being inspired by other writers. I read in different genres, not necessarily the one I'm writing in. Um, but I just think it's so important to be connected to writers at a craft level, but just to have that joy and that inspiration and, you know, to read this, sometimes I'll just read this sentence and I'll be like, that's the most perfect sentence and I'll go write it down or I'll highlight it. I'm someone who doggy is my books and I mark them up, sorry. And, <laughs> but I, yeah, it is just an amazing experience to read a sentence that's structured in a way that I would never write it that way and to see the impact that that has on me as a reader. In the writing of this, and it's probably not a surprise that I read The Year of Magical Thinking over and over again. I mean, Didion can do no wrong. Um, but also it's a scary thing when you have a writer like that because how do you even compare and how do you even compete? So I think I do read some writers and I just get so intimidated. So there, there's, the, there's that other flip side of it as well when there is someone who is so remarkable at what they do that you think well there's no point writing anything now <laughs> I've just finished I've just put down sunbathing by Isabel Beach which was just beautiful um and I also recently finished The Keepers by Al Campbell which was just jaw-droppingly beautiful and you know I think it's so important to support debut authors as well it's such a small community so yeah, when I read it, I go out of my way to try and, especially before I was published, it was almost like a good karma thing. Like I would go out of my way to find Australian debut authors because I would think, well, if they can do that, then maybe I can too one day. But yeah, I read Al's book, The Keepers, and it was just, yeah, it was just mind-blowing what she managed to do on the page. No more memoir, nothing personal. Um, fiction is next. So I'm at the beginning stages of writing fiction. Although as I'm writing some scenes, sometimes I guess fiction is a bit more um, exposing than nonfiction in some ways. So yeah, fiction and yeah, I hope to have something finished by the end of the year. Thank you so much for having me.